Sounds like a plan. I uh, I was very rewarded with this section. Actually, it was it was awesome to see. I don't know, kind of a, a real world data set or real. I don't call it real world, but a a, a reactive kind of you got you have problems with your your app right that's kind of what this whole section is about and i wanted to just expand in one quick moment prior to going into the slide deck was in shiny a lot of the topics within this dy dynamic ui if you were on a front end web development um, or maybe even a back end developer um, web developer a lot of this is handled by javascript or python and what I'm saying is JavaScript on the front end, Python on the back end, you're, you're creating a lot of these uh, user interface type languages and JavaScript is really the, the, the tool uh, or primary tool used for creating that. So I'm going to attempt, not today, but possibly with this code, I wanna see when the, when the server is running or the UI is running, how that is reacting with any of the existing calls. I have very, very strong tendencies to believe that what we're experiencing with these dynamic UI calls, UI calls are actually creating a JavaScript library in the back side uh, or, or the generated side of output. So I'm just putting that out as a hypothesis. I'll uh, try and prove my theory uh, here in a bit. So. I only wrote two learning objectives for this chapter 10 dynamic UI. And the first one was understanding relationships of the dynamic UI. What is it? How does it work? And what uh, relationship does your user interface, your browser, the, the, the actual person that's connecting to your app, and the back end server side, how do those relationships work? The dynamic UI point is all in relation to the front end of your app, the web user interface of your app. How does that uh, control or change modify the server's uh, uh, update uh, on, the, uh, on the back side of the server? The second learning objective was reviewing and testing three key techniques for creating the dynamic UI. Now, I wrote this mainly because it's literally the first paragraph of the, the chapter, um, and we'll really only today talk about the update family. I don't. I won't go past this point. So uh, maybe for next week or or the following week after, uh, tab set panels and UI output will be our next uh, discussion topics uh, past this exercise point. I did add a note here. Uh, this is my own uh, uh, opinion or vocabulary. I said use dynamic UI uh, sparingly. What you want to be careful of is that it will make your code base of Shiny app. Uh, whether it be the user interface or the server uh, .r uh, script, it's going to make it very difficult to comprehend or understand what it is that each of the steps are doing. And I believe, Kevin, if you don't mind me putting you on the spot for a second, I think you had made a similar comment prior to us even starting this chapter. Um, dynamic UI is great. It's awesome. It's kind of ninja skills but use it sparingly or, or at least keep it as simple as possible. Don't try to make this crazy eloquent, uh, you know, Mona Lisa out of your shiny app code because it may not actually work and it could be costly to the, to the application itself or the web call. Yeah, it can be a pain. <laughs> Good point, Especially sir. if you do the, uh, especially if you do the, you, um, where you do conditionals, um, like it won't, it's, can be really tricky to make it match with your inputs and maybe this goes into maybe down the line it goes into updating the tab set panel maybe i didn't understand that yeah uh, but yeah i have found it pretty frustrating i had tried to do that and went away from it but i really have embraced the update family of functions the observe event i finally have got a good grasp on that and this right. was the chapter i stole from his examples <laughs> to use in my apps. It, so. it was amazing, right? So so we're going to find here in a moment to complement or, or support Kevin's statement, we're going to find in a moment the what we're familiar with and then what this new code base is going to do or what these additional uh, points are going to, to do. It is something that would definitely make a very pleasant user experience for our, our uh, staff that would be uh, interacting with our, our web service itself. Um, it's making it even more fine-tuning knobs, like you're getting even more precise with your, your controls. So 
I, I added this code snippet here, the loading packages. Uh, the two primaries that we're dealing with are Shiny and dplyr. Um, again, the only reason I put that here was because it was in the textbook and I realized it. I don't think it matters. Um, I may remove that in the, uh, the next iteration of my presentation. Okay. So the first topic that we have is called update inputs. Now, each text input function is paired with an update reply. So what Kevin was mentioning a moment ago is that you're going to be matching these two points together. Uh, in your dynamic UI, you create this text input field, maybe it's a box, and then that is going to also be paired with that update function on the server side that will literally change what the server is, is uh, uh, providing. This update allows you to modify the control after it has been created. That comment means that once your server is up and running, you've already compiled out into HTML and, and JavaScript, et cetera. The, the web server is active. Uh, you've deployed it uh, to, a, to a web server. And so now within the code itself, you're able to modify with this particular uh, update family. And Kevin, I know that this is probably the most near and dear to your heart. Please feel welcome to jump in and uh, add any of your past experience into the, into the use of these services as well. So right out of the gate, um, I have an example and I've created this, so I'm gonna have to leave the slide deck for a moment, but uh, see uh, uh, examples 10.1. And so I'm gonna go back over to R real quick. And we are going to go to files and we're going to open 10.1. Now I've maintained these in their own single app.r formats. Um, I didn't feel it appropriate to break it apart and make it more complicated. Um, Colin, Ryan, Kevin, I do intend on pushing this up to the code base. Uh, Colin, you probably know more than anybody. The shiny, M shiny code base is getting a little bit heavy. There's a lot of files up there. Uh, and so I don't want to continually just add more bloat or more uh, examples. Um, so running this particular app, I am going to show you what it looks like. Let's put this into our browser and move the browser over. There we go. Uh, zoom in closer so we can see what's going on. The only thing that we're doing here with this particular app is you'll notice that the value n is going to update. So by putting in the minimum and maximum values, we're changing the user slide bar here. Okay, so let's change this to, I don't know, four. And then you notice that that's greater than the number three, and so it just automatically populate, populates to four to four. Now, I did find, oh, maybe it didn't, it's not doing it right now. When I was messing with this earlier, uh, it seemed to only iterate through uh, odd integers. Um, when I was increasing and decreasing, it may have been something that I may have done uh, uh, on the uh, other side here. But then now your slider option uh, is going to be incremented as well. Okay. So let's go back to the code base and kind of look at how uh, that particular call was made. So we are able to see the interface itself. And I'm just going to minimize this tab. Can't use that away completely. There we go. Um, what we're looking at on this particular tab are these extra additional events. So you have your observer event and then an update slider input. And the explanation that was being made, I need to go back to my presentation. And that is this. We're going to find I'm going to be jumping around all over the place here between the RStudio code snippets and the uh, presentation media itself. Uh, I apologize if I make anybody uh, ill watching me jump all over the pages here. With this particular setup, uh, this is a different code sequence. They are all, uh, they all take the same input as a string and then the input ID argument. So you're matching these two together. I've got a uh, input cell or input box, and then I'm listening for that modification and then changing what the server is providing to the user interface. And that's what that dynamic call uh, implies. The browser itself is updating the server's code that is providing that information back to the UI. It's not a it's not a, a, a cyclic a, a cycle cy cyclic um, issue, but it's it's the it's the user itself 
interacting with the web browser that's updating the server, the server is providing that information back uh, to your UI. Okay. These arguments modify the input constructor, and that's a, a key word, uh, and can be modified after its creation. So do you recall when I was giving the presentation to the HTML and the, the theming of, of Shiny? Um, I, there was a moment where I had the uh, developer tab open on the browser, and I think I was explaining to Shane or maybe Colin, um, I said, let's go modify this particular value inside the dev tools. And then uh, you notice that it did change on the browser. And then when I refreshed the screen, it went back to its default. That's similar to what this dynamic UI process looks like. Only we're doing it within our shiny code. If you would like, I can show you what I'm referring to. Um, I'm seeing Colin Furrow's brow uh, with, with questioning. So Ryan, you unmuted. Yeah. Um, are you saying that th this is like as temporary a thing as it was changing the developer? Kind of, kind of. So developer code? Yeah, let's let's go show you what I was referring to in a moment. Uh, let's go back to the page. Here it is. Nope, already lost it. Pull that back up. Sorry, team. Okay. Yeah, I I was furrowing my brow because I was reading the I was reading the oh, good. The, uh, the docs for updates slider input because I was kind of reading more so it wasn't your it wasn't oh, gotcha. your explanation it was <laughs> right. it was me reading <laughs> perfect perfect uh, if I go F twelve uh, uh, Ryan what I was referring to in the theming process or or explaining so if yeah. I if I uh, sorry to interrupt I, I do remember that but I always just okay. had the, the the concept in my mind that this was just sort of temporary and like a a, maybe like a test thing like you would never actually no you would never that. actually do this no yeah. um what what i was trying to to show the team at that presentation period was that the document object model your browser um is receiving information but we can interact with it we can kind of inject our own code if we wanted to and so in the topic of dynamic ui and using this shiny apps and the update family of of uh, calls it's now becoming persistent. So that update that I made earlier with this DevOps tools, let me uh, shut that off, there we go, Dev tools. Um, now what is going on is that that change that we are making from our browser within the Shiny option is going back to the server, updating the server's code, and then reserving it back up to the, to the UI. You're adding another thread, you're adding another uh, uh, call and response between your client and server with this dynamic UI. So the example I'm, I'm trying to uh, split from was I went into the browser itself, I just made some changes, and then all of a sudden the web page you know, uh, uh, was different. But if I refresh the page, meaning that I went to the server and said, please give me the code again, and it snapped back to its original, right? because it didn't technically change. Here, with that update family call, I am modifying it from the browser. It is updating the server and the server is sending that information back. So now it is persistent. Does that make sense? Um, Kevin, please feel welcome to jump in and, and uh, add your thoughts into this with uh, more user experience in this, in this topic. The, okay, let's go back to our presentation. All right, so the next, example is, is a simple use case um, where we are going to be modifying our uh, user calls. This dynamic UI controls are convenient for our users. It's intended that we as developers, we are, as the shiny developers, uh, creating this user space of interactivity, um, you're giving the user more options. They can modify some of the text within uh, fine tuning uh, to provide them the, the calculations that they're looking for. Um, if we were just building a very simple, vanilla, static, shiny app, right, everything's very blocky, it's kind of locked in, and, and we don't have any user control. What we're, what we're expressing as we go through these chapters is becoming more familiar with web development or becoming more familiar with how this relationship operates. So uh, it allows the user to feel more in the driver's seat of the app. That's not in the textbook. That's my words that I'm, I'm providing to the team. 
uh, the user feels more in control of their destiny in interacting with the web page itself. You are creating a more apt uh, uh, user experience. The next example combines the action button, the observe event button, uh, observe event call, and then the update slider input, all three of these together. So uh, I'm going to go to our C example 2, uh, 10.2. So again, for Give me, I keep jumping back and forth here. So I'm going to close that one down and we're going to stop this server. And let's go to our files. One, no. Apples, table two, app.r, and then we're going to run this particular app. In this case, the sliders are going to be able to move back and forth, right? So that's just a user input. I'm changing the slider and my numerals are also changing as well, okay? Now that I've got my adjustments, I'm gonna select the reset action button. And what that is going to do next is snap us all back to the center again, okay? So we're kind of like uh, adding a feature that says, okay, if you've went too far off the beaten path and you wanna uh, put everything back to default again, just hit the reset button and all your, all your data points reset. If we look at the code block for this, we have our slider inputs X1, X2, and X3. We have our titles on the web page X1, X2, X3. The values are all set at zero. So that's our neutral point. That's where we're gonna snap back to. Uh, the minimum is gonna be negative 10 and the maximum of is 10. So we're allowing our user uh, a total of 20 uh, data points or, or 20 numerals that they can they can adjust to. With this additional action button called reset and then labeled as capital R reset, looking at the server side function, we have these update slider input commands. So as I move my slider, I'm going to have an input ID X1 and then I'm going to snap it back to zero uh, once the reset button is hit. Okay. Again, very simple code base, but the opportunity or the action which is combining these together is, uh, is vital of comprehension. Um, I wonder if I, if you get rid of the update on the front of it, uh, is it going to change the call? I can't remember the server side of a, of a slider input, what the, what the server side receive looks like. Um, if, if, if I were to take the word update from this point, uh, is it going to just stay static so that when I hit reset, it never does anything? Um, I don't know. The, the word update on the front of this particular action is part of the family of that uh, uh, option within our user interfaces. Let's stop that server, go back to our presentation. And excuse me, not that right one. The next option is with a slight modification, we allow the user to tweak the text on the action button. Uh, this is incorporating these minor features into your web app is like styling, but from a control standpoint. I was trying to make a throwback to the theming uh, uh, conversation we were having in chapters, uh, was that six, chapter five, chapter six. And instead of the look and feel, the colors, the you know, uh, uh, shading or shadowing or anything on your web page. Here, what we're doing is creating additional features, but in this point, it's now in control. Um, I always think in 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 some video game production or some uh, movies where they have Easter eggs built into the service. I'm kind of thinking of like these dynamic dynamic UI options as almost kind of Easter eggs. Ah, I didn't realize the, the web page allowed me to do that. We as developers can add these additional features. So um, let's go to example 10.3. It is files, upward level, three app.r. Okay. And run app. Here, what we're doing is I'm going to change the number on my text box, and you will notice the number will change on my radio button. So it's saying simulate 10 times. Okay, let's increase that. 
So now it's 12 times, now it's 14 times, now it's 16 times. Um, with this text input, the relationship is between the text input and then the update call to the radio button text. Uh, looking at the code base, uh, we have a numeric input, which is the value n, and then simulations, that's the header or the, the title of that uh, input box. And then by default, it's the number 10. The action button is simulate, simulate. Uh, I've never actually, I was gonna say the radio button doesn't do anything, sorry. I wanted to confirm that that was uh, not connected to anything. On the server's side, if you notice, we have an observe event, and then the input value is n. Well, n is to the string and at the top. That's how that is applied. So these two are linked together. The label that we're doing is paste zero, simulate, and then the value of n that we entered from our text box number of times. That is the text in this radio button, simulate x number of times. Uh, the value x that I'm, or I should say n, the value n I'm referring to is the value that we're taking from the text box or the entry box. And then the update action button is what changes the text. So we take that input ID uh, equals simulate and then the label as the label itself. Any questions on that topic? I, I Well, I, I was kind of thinking about it while you were talking there, like, <clears throat> Um, and I'm kind of thinking out loud right now, but it's, you know, my question is, is like the environments, you know, like the UI environment versus the server environment mm -hmm. and how it's passing those values between the two. Like, I understand the concept, like, you know, we have this, uh, we have this input or well, we, so in our action button, we have this thing called simulate. And then we have this update action button that, you know, updates the, the value within it. But the question is, is like, and maybe I'm getting it mixed up in my head, is just like how it actually passes that value back up into the UI is what I'm kind of wondering. Because like, I, I understand like from the UI to the server, because you have the input output, you know, session, but like the passing of that information is kind of where I'm getting a little blurry and that's why i think like environments comes into play like understanding if there's a different environment for each but again i'm thinking out loud so i may be way off base no you're not at all in fact i i while you were talking i wanted to come over real quick and do some google image searching real quick um so it's very easy to see this in a swim lane diagram so imagine that you have your your various swim lanes and then the calls the arrows between each of the functions within the and I'm, I'm 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 hoping to answer your question with the concepts of what's going on between the ui and the server the document object model and the server itself when we update it is a constant back and forth connection. Um, I did HTTP, but maybe if I do TCP/IP, uh, see if that's my line works. Because while you're finding that, I'm like wondering if, like, you know, like the word simulate, like the lowercase simulate in action button is an object in our environment. Yes. And so, and since it's an object in our environment, if we that update action function can change that in the environment once we do that specific action. Right. No, you're you're stating it exactly correct. You're 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 implying it correctly. Um I'm so, moving up. Go ahead. So, so it's a <clears throat> so it's an object in the environment, but it's not a visible object in the environment. Is that correct? It's 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 inside the communication exchange between client and server. Yes, we don't see it in action. Uh, our user interface, our, our human user interface is just us using our mouse to change the values or use our keyboard to input the values to that, to that cell. On the back end of, of handling that information change is the client server handshake, this, this two part um, send and receive data back and forth. So the call when you say, um, you know, input the number 12 into my into my text box, and then you watch the radio button update to 12 as well. When that uh, value uh, happened, a message went back to the server, 
from the server back to the document object model, your browser. And so that, that radio button updates. This is probably not a good example and it has no relation at all with Shiny or any sort of development. I just did a TCP IP uh, message stack call uh, image search just briefly showing you what's going on. So on the left-hand side, we have our client. On the right-hand side, we have our server. All right, now in the middle of this, what you aren't really comprehending, and that's not a bad comment, is the internet that we just, we consider. It's just a bunch of network nodes, right? And so this spider network is sending and receiving all of this data packets, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a whole other discussion on its own. Just keep it simple between client and server. Uh, within our current laptop or when we ask it to run run the app. If you notice at the top, uh, we have 127.001 port some digit uh, that has been assigned. I am creating a web server uh, within my environment and now I have my browser interacting with it. Um, so you're not really taking place in the, in the, uh, the internet uh, exchange. But in this uh, uh, quick brief, it's saying the client itself enters a web URL and says, call to initialize or initialize the parameters. You send that URL off into the ether. It hits a dynamic network server. Uh, it registers what that uh, URL implies to the IP address or the domain in which that server lives. It routes the packet through the internet and hits that server and says, oh, okay, I know what the page you're trying to serve, which is usually index.html or htm. The index HTM uh, has the instructions to construct your particular web page. Um, you can start talking about cached memory and some other variances there too. Again, I'm going too far down the rabbit hole. The server itself responds with that, all of that information. Once the client receives that information, we have some interaction, we have some two-part exchange. So it, this is just like a phone call back and forth. You always have a transmit and receive, you always have a send and receive. That relationship in the context of this book club in the Shiny Mastering Shiny app is we have a, uh, a user interface script and we have a server script. So Colin, uh, the relationship I'm hoping to build in your, in your uh, brain is that the dynamic UI is now the user is in control. We update a variable that server is listening for that update. So the document object, your client sends it back to the server, the server updates its code, and then provides an updated web page back to the client. Ryan, and do you it, have it? Yeah. Oh, well, that makes sense. Cause I was thinking like, it's yeah. like, well, it's like, and, I, and it's going back to the foundation part of it too, is, is like, it sounds like there's technically three environments, and I'm going to explain what I mean by three here in my mind, you have the UI environment, you have the server environment, and then you have, in, I'm going to call it the in-transit environment, right? Technically, right? The, the in-transit is an environment itself. The and transport it's just, would be, yeah, transport is the, is the word you're looking for there, transport, but yes. That, yeah, yep. but, and then so like, it's just passing that variable back and forth and we're just modifying that variable back and forth into those three different environments and based on the types of input. Okay, that kind of clear, clarifies my mental model a little bit. Good, good. Uh, Ryan, did you have anything uh, in thoughts to this exchange as well or? Um, I'm looking for the high five emoji, emoji to come because that cleared up a lot of things for me. <laughs> good, good. Well, that's good. Well, and in, 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 in even labor relations, and I know I'm going off the topic, but just give me a brief second. Within the world of uh, uh, IT, right, information technology, you have network engineers, you have data engineers, you have uh, sysadmins, you have DevOps, you have all these different titles, right? Well, these titles are dedicated to a control or to a uh, uh, ownership of making sure that that service is optimal. So these different job tasks are all very much uh, spreading across. And then you'll find uh, some users that kind of think of it in a more global context. They may not know all of the intricacies of one you know, engineering level component, but they comprehend the larger scope of all of it fitting together as one. And that's 
what I'm hoping to try and convey to the to the group. So. I, have, I have another question. Yeah. So, so early on, the very first chapter, I think we did the example where you type into a text a text input box, and it updated a, a text string that said like your name, you know, yes. or you know, the state that you're in. Tex and it says you live in Tex. Then you put the A and it adds the A on and the S. And the so, so how is that? That seems to me to be a dynamic UI. So I'm trying to think in my mind how is this dynamic UI different? And is it just because we're now switching the controls that you? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll just let you answer because no, no, that's you're you're thinking in the right context because we have actually covered this topic in past chapters and the citation that I'm I'm pointing at uh, was maybe it's not that page. Oh yeah, this it is. So I don't know if you're using the electronic copy of the textbook or you have the paper version. Um, either one, I believe, probably has the footnote. I hope, uh, but there's a reference um, at least in the in the textbook version. Uh, it says. Uh, note one is uh, talking about the, uh, it's on this page, it's on this page. Give me one to read the sentence. Uh, the observer event, Ryan, what you were referring to was the observer event. And the, the, the note that they're putting on, the footnote that they're putting on this is having us go back to page 49 of the text. Mm -hmm. Page 49 of the text is in chapter probably three, maybe four. I want to say it was Colin that was given the presentation on that topic because it was a bunch of mermaid uh, uh, diagrams. Yeah, page 49 is observers, and that is in chapter three, basic reactivity. So that brings the question. It's a valid, it's a valid comment you're making. Reactive coding, right? Reactive coding means uh, this, this reactive or reaction of changes in your UI. So reactive coding means as soon as I get an input, I immediately go do something on the server. Mm -hmm. What is different about dynamic UI is now you are manipulating your document object model, you're manipulating your user interface code side, not the server code side. Make sense? I think so. Say the last sentence again, because I okay. think that's what's going to click for me. So in, in reactive programming, reactive web development, reactive coding, you're dealing with the server's end, right? It's just sitting there waiting. I'm, I'm waiting for a change, I'm waiting for a change, I'm waiting for a change. On the dynamic UI side, this particular chapter 10, now you are putting a lot of the code base in the uh, document object model, the web browser, your client's computer side. Yeah. That's the only difference between the two. It's very, very, very uh, uh, minute, uh, very similar to each other. Okay. Yeah, I, th I think I got it, and and I I don't know the best way to describe the differences, but it's almost like you're changing the buttons and you're changing the sliders and you're changing <clears throat> you're changing the things that you actually interact with. Let's that, that we'll generate put, a different output. Yeah. Well, let let's let's set it up as a relationship, right? So, like, we'll we'll use parent child as a relationship. Okay. So, in a parent child relationships, obviously the parent is more senior. They're they're uh, uh, smart. I won't say smarter, but they're uh, they're they're more mature. We'll just say that, right? The child is obviously of of you know younger stature, uh, not as. Uh, uh, apt in years, they don't have a lot of the user experiences, et cetera. They're, they're less mature. Okay, so that's just a, a, a common child or parent child relationship. What is happening in that statement or my comparison would be the server versus the UI. The server is the parent, the UI is the child. Okay. Now, what we're flipping in chapter 10 is kind of almost putting the uh, UI as being the parent and the, the uh, server as being the child. Uh, or inverting it, I guess, and, and that happened. So with that explanation, uh, uh, section or uh, example 10.3, uh, I'm going to move back to our presentation and display the hierarchical text boxes. Um, so Kevin, you had made a comment at the very beginning of our presentation about this topic. You had mentioned that some of your code base uh, changes and you were trying to to uh, uh, master some of the hierarchical selection here. 
what we're doing in a hierarchical selection is providing some level of interaction with the data set itself and the presentation to the user. So we're going to, uh, there's a whole chunk of extra text here that I'm just going to read to us um, that uh, Mr. Wickham has uh, authored uh, in our book. Hierarchical select boxes are a bit more complicated, but we can allow for a far more pleasant user experience, especially if you have a large list of options for your user. Okay. Ryan, I believe during one of your presentations, maybe a couple of weeks ago, you had made a statement, it might not even be in this book club, it could be some other comment, uh, but I think you had been the presenter for that section. Your statement had uh, some level of reference to a very long list down a web page. And then the, the other reply, I believe the person was saying is that web pages are, are infinitely long, right? If I wanted to display a, you know, 10 million long data set on a web page, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to continually scroll into infinity. Okay. With this particular uh, uh, hierarchical selection, we can now subset or uh, uh, look at the data set and provide the user a selection of options that would be a little bit uh, simpler to view. Right. So instead of 10 million lines of text, we may have like you know, a, a drop down of 20 options, you select the option and that's what's being presented. Uh, the data set that was used in this is the sales data sample.csv. Um, I think I put a link to where you can download it. I don't know, maybe I didn't, okay. Uh, it's, there's a URL in our textbook that uh, this is from a Kaggle uh, website. Um, so it's a, it's a sales data set is where this is coming from. And the uh, building of this particular data, data table or uh, data frame is uh, we're selecting the territory, customer name, and order number out of this data set. And then we're arranging it by the order number. Arranging means that we're listing it in that chronological order. Okay. Uh, that block of code is just me showing you that the, the sample is available. So now I'm going to jump over to 10.4. But before I do that, let's talk about what exactly uh, Mr. Wickham in the authoring of this text was choosing to do. The first point was that each territory contains a customer, each customer has multiple color, uh, multiple orders, and that each order contains a row. So the storyboarding or the design of this particular shiny app that he had created as an example was he wanted the user interface to have an option of selecting a territory to see all the customers, selecting a customer to see all the orders that are dedicated to that customer, and then selecting an, a, a particular order uh, to see any underlying rows that we have. Okay, So his storyboard, uh, I don't, yeah, I guess he's using first person here. Uh, so Mr. Wickham wrote this. I'm just copying and pasting the text. He says, I created a reactive territory that contains the rows from the sales column that match the selected territory. Then, whenever the territory changes, I updated the list of choices in the inputs customer name select box. Third, I created another reactive call where I'm uh, calling from the customer that contains the rows from territory that match the selected customer. Now, if you're reading this and trying to process it in your head, it is going to be a little funny to track with. But if we go up to the data set and you actually look at what he's doing by subsetting these, it's, it's just basic grouping. So I select a customer. Uh, within that customer, I have uh, maybe it's territory. Is that what it was first? I select a territory. Inside the territory is a list of customers. I select the customer, and now I, I subset into their particular orders. So the fourth and fifth options here is whenever the customer changes, I update the list of choices in the input order number selection box. I display the selected orders in the output data. Okay, so now after reading that, I'm gonna go run this code and we're gonna go look at example 10.4. All right. Um, okay, I got 15 minutes left. Um, I don't even know if I can get to the exercises with the amount of talking we're doing or I'm doing. Um, stop the server, back to files, up to 10.4, run the app, and we will get to see this. Here, I'm going to do it in the browser because it's going to be really awesome to see. So let's minimize that. Okay. 
So remember, we're selecting the territory, which updates the customers. We select the customer and updates the, the order number. The output is going to be this small data frame or this table, HTML table, that is going to uh, reactively update. So in territory, let's just say EMEA, uh, and I don't know what that uh, stands for. And then the customer, uh, again, we're subsetting. So uh, all of the customers that are associated with that territory now become a hierarchical list of selection. So let's use our style, uh, stylish desk decors company. Okay. Now I update the list of order numbers and it appears that we have three, uh, 10, 129, 175, and 354, uh, 351. Let's just use 351 as an example. So now all of the rows that are associated to this call are displayed. When I watched this particular UI and started to comprehend this dynamic sort of call stack, it immediately screamed to me databasing and uh, uh, SQL languaging. So in, in a report or some form of SQL language, you could query uh, or, or combine tables to create this particular data set. I'm looking at the database. I want this this uh, uh, this variable, that variable, and this variable. Show me everything that's associated with it, and then that's our output side. But this isn't a database. It's all completed through just a data frame that we've ingested into our Shiny server, and now we're just interacting with it. So let's go look at the code base real quick and review what this snippet looks like. So. For the purposes of our explanation, um, I left the global environmental variable of uh, ingesting and producing this uh, environment. Um, I left outside of the Shiny app itself. Um, I wasn't going to try and create it inside the app. I just left it as is. But we have a select input territory, customer name, and order number. So remember that the lowercase points are going to be in association with this bottom section below. The text that we witness on the screen is again in uppercase, territory, customer, and order number. And then the choices, what is unique to start this entire process is this uh, sales territory. So that's our first real logic. We're, uh, once we have the associated territory, then all the other data comes along with. Right. So let's, uh, uh, finally, I'm sorry, on the UI side, uh, you have your uh, table output is data, and that's what creates the data frame below. On the server side, you will notice that we have these update select input calls. So by having a choice as a unique variable calling territory, we are selecting the customer name. Then the customer uh, is a reactive call. Uh, we do have a requirement in there that is waiting for input to select the customer name before filtering the territory the customer name, uh, customer name equals customer name, input customer name. Now we have an observe event uh, with choices being the unique customer order numbers. Uh, with the selection from the user, our data frame updates uh, with the selected input of order number and then choices. So the output, this creation at the bottom, this table at the bottom, is output data render table. We remember in past chapters where we talked about render page, render table, render, et cetera. So this is a render table with a requirement before. So this is not a reactive call. It is a requirement for the input order number to be selected. Otherwise, it doesn't run. Then the second point is customers. And then this is the pipe is filtering by order number, uh, input order number, and then passing it to the selected quantity order, price of each, and price code. That's what creates the columns of that table. What are your thoughts? Um, Ryan, for your purposes, this literally just jumped out at me. I know, Colin, you deal with a lot of uh, databasing as well. Um, if you were to ingest an entire data frame into your Shiny server and then just make these reactive update dynamic UI calls, it kind of almost creates a sort of reporting type feature. Um, Devin, I think in your profession, sir, um, is this something that you do quite often? Well, I've finally been able to implement it. Um, I've used this model to improve my app 
quite a bit. I was having multiple tables, so it's multiple tables to keep up with. Now, okay. so I'd have multiple pages. Like, hey, now go to this page to look if you want, because I'd have grants, and then you'd have school sites where they'd go to. So I'd have a separate page for that. I so now that. I'm able when they select a grant. I did have it where it was listing every single site. But now I've brought that down to like uh, just the sites for that grant. And, and is it is awesome. it is it the filtering that's doing that, Kevin? Yes. Is that yes. giving you the option? It's awesome. The uh, updated because once it sees what grant, it's only going to pull. So now it's filtering the sites just based upon that grant. So now your options have diminished because they have like up to like for a while like forty sites. So you don't you don't want all that. So I, I was having to split it off across different tables. But when I saw this example, I tried like heck to um, implement it. Yeah, it took me a while, but I got there. <laughs> so I um, love this example. It's my favorite. No, this, for me uh, and, and Colin and Ryan, this is actually the point in this chapter where things started to the rubber was beating the road. I finally started to comprehend how to manipulate or the dynamic web UI uh, uh, concept of, of this particular example. So um, I've got two more. And given the time frame we're running at, I've got eight minutes left. Um, are we OK if I continue on, uh, at least for one more example? OK, um, back to our presentation, because now I think the next section is going to be uh, no, it's freezing. Sorry. I was trying to get to circular references. Um, I've got a little bit of a joke in our presentation that uh, I wanted to share with everybody. So in the freezing reactive inputs, <clears throat> what's happening here is that we're actually selecting, uh, selecting two different data frames. When the <clears throat> dynamic UI is making the change to the server and the server is sending that information back, changing the data, data set, data frame, there is a tendency to almost unsync between your server and your and your uh, client UI. And when that happens, you're going to get this very insidious kind of pause flicker in your in your uh, uh, website. Similar to the hierarchy of select boxes, there are many times where the user selects inputs but will provide an output or excuse me, will not provide an output or worse, cause a calculation error. Um, again, that's my words, not the textbook. Uh, this particular code example is creating this uh, uh, freezing example. It's, it's changing data sets back and forth. And so what I'm going to do is I've hyperlinked uh, to um, Mr. Wickham's Hadley's uh, uh, shiny IO website uh, where he has this uh, code actually running. So I've already got that pulled up. Oh, no, I have to reload. Sorry. Pull this over so the team can see it and we'll let it refresh. So this particular uh, call is called MS freeze. And the section is what we're doing is choosing the data set. Now, by selecting between pressure and cars, you'll notice ever so slightly that there will be a flicker in this row of text that we're witnessing. So I'm gonna change to cars, all right? And change back to pressure. Do you see how it kind of flickers back and forth? Well, if you were to record that and pause at that moment, you would notice that everything is null values or zeros. And what is happening is because the selection box is sending back to the server, the server is, is uh, modifying its, its uh, code base and then serving up a new um, uh, table, that unsyncing that I was referring to is where what creates that uh, break in our code. Um, we could probably exacerbate this problem by having maybe a larger data set um, or maybe even uh, creating more information on the page that has to populate. Um, what I'm talking about is just creating a, a, a larger gap of time that the uh, server and the client is disconnected or unsynced with each other. Okay. Uh, the Choosing the temperature doesn't really change anything. And so that's what I wanted to uh, highlight, if anything, if I could give any critique, I would say move this down a little bit further. Uh, so you're bringing your users focus on this one text box, but it's covered up every time you uh, select this. So you don't really get to see 
uh, that there is no flicker at all. It's only in the data set that it's created. Okay. Um, and then the next topic was discussing, oh, uh, to prevent that freezing function to occur, um, that's why we have the, the actual tables here uh, or the code blocks here. What we're going to notice, the first one is the version of block that creates the problem. In the bottom half, um, we are adding this extra line of text called freeze reactive value. And it's looking for the input and then the column itself. This one line of text allows the system to not react, the server not to react to the change until it's ready to serve the information. So what occurs with this change is you nullify that freezing effect. And the statement uh, made by the author says, um, it is a best practice to use the freeze reactive value anytime, anytime you use input values. Um, Kevin, I'm thinking of you on this one, sir. Uh, so when you're wanting to br break the reactive uh, frantic change between server UI client uh, handshake, you want to add this freeze reactive value. This allows the server and the browser itself, the UI, uh, to stay in sync with each other. And the quoted text says, use freeze react value to tell, to tell all downstream calculations that an a, NA input value is stale and that they should save the effort until it is useful. There's no requirement to quote unquote unfreeze anything. That's just the server providing that information back to the user. Um, so similar to our rec requirements, and I don't recall the other one that pauses reactive coding. Um, Kevin, I think you were presenting on that section, sir. Um, that one maybe validate, that's validate. the other one. Yeah, I think it was, yeah. So what we're doing is just creating this breakpoint that prevents the server from constantly uh, uh, sending out data over and over again. You know, I, uh, I was gonna say, I, last Saturday, I put this into production, the freeze. Did you? After reading it, yeah. Well, so- <laughs> Put that right you know, in Saturday. <laughs> Well, it's it's kind of like you know you're 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 a developer you're you're testing your UI and 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 maybe different browsers etc. And you see this kind of weird habit or this weird funny thing that's occurring on your web page and you're like why is that happening? You're in the debug you know trying to see exactly what the call stack looks like and figuring out you know is a, is it is an error in my calculations is an error in my code? No, it's just because the reactive uh, immediate response. Uh, value of how Shiny operates, we need to create this freeze reaction value to pause and allow those two to come back in sync with each other. All right, I'll stop here, but I did want to at least uh, uh, make a, a funny joke, and I don't know if anybody will find humor in my comment or not, but um, as a early uh, software uh, computer science student, uh, this is one of my favorite, favorite topics uh, when you're trying to write code and all of a sudden you have a for loop that just goes off into infinity um, or you forget to break your while loop or you forget to, to uh, do any sort of circular references or, or uh, infinite uh, logic. I said circular references equals stack overflow. You are going to literally crash your server. Uh, and I said, finally, uh, infinite loops and circular references can, will, and always cause extreme and costly uh, on the server and worse. Um, it's actually a, a security vulnerability. If you want to bring down servers, uh, it's an exploit. You find the one call that creates a bunch of chaos on the server side, and then you just immediately uh, keep uh, 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 stimulating that one issue until the server just literally crashes because it can't keep up. So I'm going to close with this. Colin, if you don't mind, uh, I may be like one minute over, but I wanted to show you what this, it's a really, really simple example, um, but I loved the fact that it worked this way. Um, and this is literally my last example. So um, I'll hit run. And then you'll notice uh, if I put this out in the browser, um, it's just gonna continually count up until infinity, right? Well, there's gonna be a point where the system crashes, right? Um, your computer, that we're running the server on is fairly up to date. But if we were to run this for, you know, 20 hours straight, um, 
you've probably heard people try to calculate pi. Pi is an infinite number, 22 divided by seven. And they try to see how infinitely precision decimals they can, they can extend it on. Um, there are points where it will crash your computer. So mm -hmm. this is a perfect example of a, a, a script that was, uh, is, is, has no breakpoint. Let me see if I can get out of here and just close this down. So did you just crash your server? I didn't. No, I wanted to, I wanted to get back. I was trying to figure out a way if I could stop it. Um, but what is happening here is the numeric input N and then you're updating N. So your, your observe event is input value N and then update numerical input, and then you're updating N. So the uh, cir circular or cyclic uh, call is just UI, the server, server back to UI. Um, if you were to watch this particular thread on, you know, Wireshark or some kind of a, a network tool, monitoring tool, you would just see uh, uh, packet uh, calls flying across the screen uh, with that particular instance. So oh, I guess it's still running. Let me stop it. There we go. Cool. Well, thanks, Ryan. I uh, really appreciate your work on that. Um, yes. uh, I So then, well, I guess for next week, we'll finish that up. And then do you want to cover dynamic visibility uh, in the that, next section? Is and Because the I was looking at the, that's the next one after the updating inputs, then the next big section is dyna or dynamic visibility. Yeah. And then, I, um, go ahead. With, with Kevin's permission, yes. Unless Kevin, if, if you, I, I, I know this entire chapter is near and dear to your heart. If there, if you feel uh, obligated as well, I don't want to uh, step in between you. No, I actually like watching on this because okay. I'm digging deep into it. So. Good. Um, I'll go ahead and volunteer then, Colin, if that's okay with the team. Okay. And then I was looking, I was looking at the creating UI or the, the last section of this. Um, and it talks about functional programming. So I thought about, I'm pretty good with per and map. So okay. um, if I can take on that one too. So he gives you a little bit of a break so you don't have to do the whole thing. Okay. But I'm pretty good with per and map. And so I could probably try and look at this and figure out what's going on and kind of present on it too. So okay. um, Colin, that, do you- Is that 10.3, oh, Colin? Yeah, unless you want it, Ryan. No, no I, want... I don't. I was just trying to, it just says creating UI with code. And so I was trying to uh, see where the per and the map came in on that, but. That looks awesome. It's creating the UI with per. <laughs> it oh, wow. is awesome. That looks... I, yeah. I, I, I was looking at it and I was like, I think I know, I like kind of understood what it was doing. And so I understand functional programming. It's just applying functional programming within Shiny and so. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good with, I'm pretty good with per and, and the map functions and stuff. So. No, I, cool. I think it might be a, a, a good time for my disclaimer that this stuff is getting kind of beyond me. So I am happy to jump in wherever I can, but um, I don't know that I would be able to dive as deep into any of the remaining chapters as the rest of you. So I'm not trying to, to dip out, but I also don't want to, um, you know, I mean, not have anything. Good. As I'm watching things like, well, bookmarking, I know how to create a bookmark. Uh, I don't know anything about tidy evaluation. Uh, I actually would enjoy doing tidy evaluation because that's something that I've tried to read over and over again. And I still like don't understand, like I understand it, like to use it and be dangerous with it. But like, when do you use the double curly braces? When do you use the walrus? symbol and so yeah I, I would like to do that one but somebody can take that one as well um but we could talk about it we could we could put it in the slack and kind of figure it out but at least we got for next week it sounds like we got dynamic ui covered and then um we just go from there and ryan if you want to look ahead and see if there's one that you know that you do want to do yeah you know and again, we're all learning. Like I'm already, I'm already way above my head too. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm not <laughs> taking myself off the list, but um, I just thought I would mention. So we could also nominate any of the people that aren't here. So <laughs> there we go. Self-nominate. Uh, the um, the the one comment, Colin. So uh, in our Slack, you had mentioned uh, possibly uh, using the previous notes. Um, I did actually start there first, and as I was 
studying it and, and reading the past uh, uh, input, I'm like, I, I'm not finding the voice here. It didn't, it didn't seem to me to make sense. So I did recreate this. I will push it up to, uh, I think I'm linked to your um, Colin uh, uh, forked repository. So I may just update it to yours. And then if you accept the changes or whatever the case may be, but um, well, actually, yeah. actually do it to the main one because okay. I talked I talked to John about that because somebody did that before and, and John just said just do it into the main one because okay. I'm 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 a reviewer, he's a reviewer, so you'll still get a review process before it gets integrated into Good. it. So okay. Um, um cool. Uh like I if people gotta go, you know, I'll I can hang out for a little bit, a little bit longer if people want to hang out. Um, but you know, we're kind of at seven, so I don't want to make sure anybody feels like they're obligated they have to stay. So just a quick thing. Did anyone figure out the exercise with the date, updating the date? Because I did cheat and I looked for the solution to that. And uh, I found it, I think they almost, you had to do some JavaScript. It was a little bit out of bounds. Just to let you know, it was a little bit out of bounds of the, the solution that I found online was a bit out of bounds of the chapter context. So just so you know, they even put, a, put an issue into Shiny. So don't get too hung up on that first exercise because I about went insane on the date. Is it, is it number the, one? Yes. Okay. I I was going. I don't I don't understand this. I'm okay cheating if I don't. I mean, I'll give it a try, but there was a limit. I'm like, I have no idea. But just giving you guys context, don't get too hung up on that one. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna drop off, guys. Uh, it was good to see you as always. Agreed. We'll catch up next time. All right, All right everybody. Have a good night. All right. See ya. Talk to you later. Thanks, everyone. Bye. See ya. Bye.